But this morning I want to, to share from a scripture that is very well known. I'm sure some of you would know what I'm, the scripture once I mention the verse. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 31. Isaiah 40, 31. Come on, let me hear you. Oh, you need to go to your Bible. But they that wait upon the Lord shall have their strength renewed. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Now, we claim this scripture, we confess this scripture, uh, and, and we know this scripture. But let me take an opportunity to put the scripture in context. By going through the whole of the chapter of Isaiah chapter 40. This verse is the culmination. This verse is the crescendo. This verse is the ultimate of what Isaiah is showing us in chapter 40. So from verse, verse 1 to 5. Isaiah is talking about a restoration. He says, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. So, so this is a time of restoration. I don't know if you're here this morning and you feel because the, the Bible said the sons of Issachar, they were different from the other sons of Israel. They understood the times and they understood the seasons. And I want to declare to you today that there is a season of restoration. It's a season that is permeating the atmosphere and as many as believe shall receive in the name of Jesus Christ. So Isaiah is saying there's a new season. God is about to do a new thing. But you see, the only person that can withhold God from doing what he's about to do is those he's doing it for. Amen? So there's a new season. The voice of him, I'm in verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. For every valley, this is your portion, for every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. So this morning I am just Isaiah prophesying to you that the season has come when God will bring restoration. Restoration in so many different areas. Different people begin to see different aspects of their life, lives being restored. All the years, all the years that the palmer worm, the caterpillar, the locust have eaten, God will restore. Amen? And so, Isaiah then now jump to verse 10. Now read from verse 10 to 14. Isaiah then paints a picture of who this God is. A promise has been made. But you know when somebody makes you a promise, somebody comes up to you at the end of today's service and says, by the end of tomorrow I would have paid a million dollars into your account. Give me your account number. What's the first thing you do? You take a good look at them. You want to know if this person even looks like they have the capacity to give you. Because otherwise, you will not give them your account number. Because you think they have something else in mind. So, the promise has been made. And now, Isaiah turns to the promisor. And wants us to know a bit about him. So that we can believe the promise. Because believing the promise is crucial to receiving the promise. Amen, somebody. Come on, am I talking to a lump of potatoes today? Am I talking to human beings who have blood in their veins and can say amen and can say hallelujah from time to time? Amen. Behold, the Lord will come with strength. 
strong hand and his arm shall rule for him behold reward is with him and his work before him so it's God there's no arm that is stronger than the arm of God there is no arm no matter how it may look nothing can outmaneuver God nobody can scheme a scheme that takes God by surprise amen he shall feed his flock like a shepherd he shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young and then he just asks a few questions who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand just the hand take a look at your hand make it hollow how much water can you put in that hand how much and meted out the heaven with the span and comprehended the dust of the earth see God has rivers seas oceans in the hollow of his hand amen that's the God that made this promise that's him amen he measured, he meted out the heavens with a span and comprehended the dust. That means that he knows every speck of dust on the earth. Now, I don't think man has invented a computer that can calculate how many specks. But God, at every point in time, knows every speck of dust on the earth. He knows everything. He didn't even decide or count the hairs on your head because the hairs on your head did not happen arbitrarily. They were destined by God to happen that way. So he knows all the hairs on your head. He determined them. He put them there. So ladies, when you go to the hairdresser, make sure that you don't destroy what God has done. Who hath directed the spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor, hath taught him? Who can direct him? No, no one, nothing is found. Search the earth. Search the, the, the solar system. Search our galaxy. Search the universe. There is none that has the ability or capacity to direct God. With whom took he counsel? And who instructed him and taught him in the path of judgment? Who? Who did he consult? The only time you see consultation in scripture is let us. He consulted himself. Amen. No one else has the knowledge or understanding or wisdom. God indeed is sovereign. This is the promise of Isaiah chapter 40. A sovereign God before whom there is none. Beyond whom there is none. After whom there can be none. And then let me jump to verse 15. Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beasts thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. Uh, what is Isaiah saying? We want to make sacrifices to God. God accepts our sacrifices. But our sacrifices really, they're very they're insignificant to him. He's not, he, he's not looking for the sacrifice because of anything he can benefit from the sacrifice. He's looking to the sacrifice because of what you can benefit as you bring your sacrifice, as you make sacrifices, a sacrifice of your life unto him all nations before him are counted as nothing and they are counted to him less than nothing and vanity 
to whom then will ye liken God or what likeness will you compare unto him and then just to help us Isaiah talks about people who come to know God and are trying to depict him by some image on earth. So in verse 19, he says, The workman melteth a graven image, and the goldsmith spreadeth it with, over with gold, and casteth silver chains. He that is so impoverished that he cannot afford to make a, a, a golden image, he says, he takes a tree that will not rot. He seeketh unto him a cunning workman to prepare a graven image that shall not be moved. There is nothing that man can produce that can even begin to show us who our God is. There is nothing we can make with our hands that can ever be a representation of our God. You know, that's one reason why I tell people, especially if they're not Roman Catholics, that Jesus Christ is not on the crucifix, he's not on the cross anymore. He rose from the cross. So when you wear a crucifix, you're kind of trying to put him back on the cross. He rose from the cross. Amen. The cross is bare. Amen. Have ye not known? Have ye not heard? Hath it not been told you from the beginning? Have ye not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. God is beyond our greatest imagination. You know, the scripture tells us God is love. Not God loves. It's possible to love and God loves, but he is love. You see, awesome. Let's go now to Isaiah 40 verse 31. And you know, many times when we read this verse, what comes to us first is mount up. Everybody wants to mount up with wings as eagles. Everybody wants to run and not be weary. To walk and not faint. But the key, the key to this verse the key to unlocking this promise made by an awesome God who is more than able to keep his promise, the key to restoration, because he says renewal of strength, the key to this verse is the word wait. But they that wait. Anytime you hear the word wait it is telling you to do something anytime in any context when you hear the word wait it's making a demand of you the word wait means be patient be patient and you see if you go to James chapter 1 verse 2 he says rejoice when you face different kinds of trials for the trying of your faith works patience and when patience has had a, her work completed her work you will be perfect and entire wanting nothing patience so this verse is saying that in all our dealings with God we must learn to be patient 
patience or let me use the word wait means another thing when somebody asks you to wait they are asking you to submit your own timing to abandon your own timing and adopt their timing not so they say wait you know it's like um, somebody invites you to a function and they say it's starting at four when I start getting dressed so I can leave at half past three so that I can get there at four my wife would say she <laughs> you know um, so we don't get to leave till after four so I have submitted my own sense of timing to hers okay <laughs> maybe that's not a very good example and she's probably watching this on live stream right now <laughs> Sorry, dear. <laughs> so, God has a better sense of timing than we do. You see, when the Bible talks about Jesus, it says things like, but when the time was fully come. Everything that God does is perfectly on time, his timing. You see, and for a God that isn't even confined to the realms of time, can you imagine? If you lived outside the confines of time, you still dictate everything about time. That's our God. So whenever somebody says, wait, it's put your time aside and adopt my time. And you see, that becomes a very difficult chore for us sometimes and I don't know if there's anybody here that gets impatient from time to time sometimes we become impatient and when we become impatient it is not possible for us to wait we're refusing to wait sometimes we look at timing I, I, I Pastor Sam was sharing with me he was at the dedication of a brother in Christ who was married 18 years without a child 18 not so pastor huh? 18 years and they had no child and I, I, I am sure people had all manner of suggestions for them I, I, I've heard of one lady that had not had a child for a few years and and this a <laughs> mother-in-law said why, why don't you just uh, go to bar beach there's a bath that you can take naked in the bar beach and you will have a child and this educated woman because of the pressure they let me go so people would come under so much pressure to abandon god's timing amen and so for 18 years no child then a child, I think the first child was one child. It was a, a single child first, a boy first. And then a couple of years later, two or three years later, they've just had twins. Twins. 18 years and then when it's time, they come quickly after one another. So God's sense of timing. Now if you had told them 18 years ago that um, it would be 18 years before they had their first child, they'd have a problem believing you and they would have said Lord don't, don't let it be like this but as they went through it God gave the grace to wait let me just touch another point about patience if we accept and we realize that we need to be patient in our dealings with God then why can't we be patient with one another? Why can't we? If God requires patience, then why can't we be patient with one another? You know, I, I see how 
so easily people become offended and even when the offender rejects re regrets it and apologizes the patience to help them through is not there I will not open myself for you to do that to me again patience so God is patient with us he expects us to be patient with him the word wait upon or wait on the Lord as we see in this scripture Isaiah chapter 40 verse 31 is a Hebrew word kava which also means to look unto so to wait upon the Lord does not just require patience does not just require his sense of timing not ours it also requires focus we need to stay focused on him and this is easy to say but in reality there are many things to be focused on and the God of this world is an expert as a distraction I think that is one of his most potent weapons distract you from that to which you should be focusing so that you miss it and don't even know so to look upon the Lord to have an undivided focus on him on his promise that is to unlock this verse to receive the promise of this verse to look upon him to look upon him there's only one way you must trust him you can't look upon somebody for a solution you desire if you haven't come to trust him one of the challenges of this age is we find it difficult to trust one another there are people that will say I trust no man and I say you're gonna have a very tough life because if you take your car to the station to fill it up with petrol and the attendant is there you don't trust him you think he puts salt into your tank okay we, we, we see our ability to trust one another is predicated on our ability to trust God if we can't trust God it'd be difficult to trust people so when you enter any relationship with a man trust God to help you trust him and there's a limit there's a limit you're not going to hand over the keys to your new BMW to somebody you've only just met but over time he will begin to become more trustworthy amen so we need to trust God to receive from him faithful is he that promised is he able sure is he willing sure he made the word he gave the word so we must be able to trust him there's another word that wait means it's this word enter twine it means he that is intertwined with God he that has communion with God 
he that it is difficult to separate which is him and which is God. He that has a relationship, a growing relationship, listen to me, please. We're not here for magic. You know, we're here in a relationship that is growing. And, 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 and I said, there's a lot, we have an adversary. There's a lot of deception around. There are those that will will tell you that you can live whatever kind of life you want to live you can do whatever you do all you need to do to get blessed by God is come and sow a seed so we've got a lot of sowing seeds going around right now sow this, sow that, sow that don't do the other things that you need to do and your seed will not produce any harvest the guarantee we have is that whenever there's a harvest it's because there was a seed time but whenever there's a seed dam, does not mean there will be a harvest. You leave the seed in the field. Don't tend it. Don't nurture it. Sow it on, 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 on bad soil and it will not grow. So trust. We must learn to trust God. To wait also means three things. To wait for to wait on and to wait upon to wait for is what Moses said to God when God said okay I won't destroy my people Israel you go but I'm not going and Moses said ah, what good are we if we are to go and you do not follow us or you do not lead us Waiting for God is to say, until God shows up, I ain't going nowhere. Let me go to, to wait upon, because we, we've talked about wait on, patience. To wait upon means to minister to. To minister to means to serve. We serve God when we gather together and praise and worship Him. We're ministering to Him. We minister to Him when we take some service, maybe in the choir, maybe an usher. We minister to Him when we, we preach the gospel to others. We minister to God. To wait upon Him means to minister to Him. Remember, I'm talking about restoration. If you can do these things, this is the key. If you can do these things, he says, the Lord shall renew your strength. And we could be tempted to think that strength God is talking about is physical strength. Our capacity, our ability to do things in the realm of the physical. But God is talking about renewing your strength all strength the strength of your soul your mind the strength of your spirit god will renew he will restore you to the place that you ought to be he will renew your strength somebody god is about to renew your strength you become weary become weary with the journey of life and saying how can we continue like this continue because God will renew your strength. It, it's just go, keep going. You might not know the precise moment, but God will not let you run out of strength. Amen? Amen. He will renew your strength. He says, they shall mount up with wings as eagles. How many, how many, how many of you can imagine yourself like an eagle being able to soar through the skies the eagle was not picked arbitrarily by Isaiah the eagle was picked because the eagle is the highest flying bird
it's also got phenomenal eyesight an eagle from its height can see a fish swimming in the river and target it I mean it locks onto that fish and it will swoop and pick it up with its talons and go that fish is gone his eyesight he gives vision very sharp vision and focus another thing about the eagle is it has two double eyelids two eyelids you have one when you shut your eyes and on a sunny day the light still gets in no no is anybody here that has double eyelids <laughs> you look very strange if you were and what that does for the eagle is when it has any uh, attackers what the eagle does is it turns and faces the sun and begins to fly in the direction of the sun its eyes closed because of its double eyelids it doesn't get blinded by the sun but all its attackers are blinded by the sun so they peel off when we turn and face the son of righteousness not s-u-m but s-o-n when we turn and face him we can close the eyes of our our faith because we're looking towards him we can we can close our eyes and everyone who has not got was not focused on jesus peels away hallelujah and i could go on and on about the eagle that's the promise you shall mount up with wings as eagles they shall run and not be weary I don't know about you but when you talk about running you're talking about running with your vision and how many times do you pick a vision you know it's a God given vision you pick the vision and you begin to run but after some time you you just can't go on because you're weary you're tired it's it's still there in your eyes you still know that this is what God wants you to accomplish but you're running out of steam God knows that you will run out of steam but he says when I renew your strength you will run with your vision and you won't give up you won't feel like giving up you keep on running with that vision you shall run and not be weary they shall walk and not faint how many times have you felt like giving up on your walk with God or your walk with anybody else for that matter you're in a relationship and sometimes how many people here sometimes feel as if God is not listening to them is there anybody thank you for being honest man will feel that way from time to time why because we're men let me tell you god's always listening but you have to be able to submit to his sense of timing because he will come through he will come through when it is time amen he says you walk and you won't faint hallelujah hallelujah Please click the red button below to subscribe to our channel and the bell right next to it to get reminders when we upload our latest sermon. And join our web church at glahq.org. Thank you and God bless.